G'day. For some time I've been promising that I'll make myself a tapping arm. Now, for those who are not familiar with what a tapping arm is, it's, it's basically a device that helps hold the, the tap square to the work. Uh, typically they use an arm or parallelogram or something like that. And so I'm just building one for a, for a small workshop like this. Uh, most of the time I'm pretty good with, with tapping things that uh, where the, the tap has to be square to the work but every so often I have a bad day and there are some times when I'm trying to tap things into um, circular features uh, and get it radial and I miss that too so this is this is just something to try and help that out. This is the first part and there'll be another part uh, for, for actually holding the tap. This is my starting piece. Uh, this is a pattern halfway through being made. I still need to put some uh, bog in there to smooth out the, uh, the sharp corners. But this is a bracket which is then going to clamp onto the T-slots of my table so I can have it there and there and there or there and there or, or whatever. From there I've got a shaft that's coming up and that's going to be the basis for this, uh, this device. The reason I'm doing it as a, um, as a pattern for a casting is I, I figured well you know, to machine this is actually reasonably complex. When making up a pattern, you can cheat a bit by just sort of cutting out little bits and pieces and gluing them on. Still have to have the draft on there, but um, this is actually an easy way to, to, to do this. And the other nice thing about a pattern like this is that if someone else wants to make one of these, I've got the pattern, I can get one cast. In a previous video for the uh, Hercus Knuckle, I was asked in the comment section, why didn't I just make up a casting? Um, it's a good question. I guess it comes down to how many you're going to want and what the likelihood of it, it um, being needed again is. Uh, you know, the nice thing about having a pattern is once you have the pattern, you can make up, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50, whatever of, of, the, of the parts. Whereas if you machine it out of solid, you, it's, it's basically one off. But there's also a cost aspect too. To get this made cost me $90. Now, I could have bought a lump of aluminium which I could machine out of solid for about 40. Probably the amount of time I spent um, making the pattern was probably similar to the amount of time I'd spend machining it out of solid. So, you know, when you think about it that way, this has cost twice as much as it would have cost if I, if I don't value my time, uh, as, a, as, as it would have cost if I'd, if I'd machined from solid. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, yes, multiple runs, easier or better to have a casting, uh, but for a one-off, machining from solid usually is the, is the better way to go. This casting is a rather simple one to machine in that all I need, want to do with this is clean up that, that bottom surface and then once I've got that flat I can then bore a hole into this cylindrical piece here and that hole should be square to this surface. There's also three holes here for hold downs but that's um, that's a secondary importance. So I've got this clamped down on a couple of one two three blocks here. This this one here uh, if I had another one two three block I could use I'd, I'd be using that but uh, as it is um, that'll have to do. Measuring from you know there to there, it's it's almost the same height, and by the time I clean that up, that should be fine. Uh, it's it's just that I like these things supported. If I didn't have that supported, it'd flap in the wind. I'm going to machine in here as as best I can, and then I'll change my clamping positions, and I'm hoping that nothing will move, and so I can then come up and clean up the ends. Uh, one other option is to do that that clean up where you can but then clamp it down to, to bore the hole, uh, supporting it on parallels on those first surfaces. And once that hole's bored, then putting a piece of rod in there, putting it on the lathe, and then just running a skim across there on the lathe. So that's another option to, to do if you've got a lathe with a more than uh, six inch diameter swing. I'm about to swap clamps over here. A uh, couple of points worth noting. Firstly, if you're going to do this sort of thing, put your new clamp in before you remove your old clamp. Uh, and the reason for that is that's holding that down on there quite nicely. I've put this clamp in here. 
and that'll, that'll continue to hold that so I can take that off and that should, fingers crossed, stay at the same height. If I took that clamp off because of the, the unevenness and all that sort of thing of this setting, even when I clamp this back down, it might move slightly. So that's one thing. The other thing is that traditional knowledge and practice says when you're using um, strap clamps like this, this end should be higher than the surface you're clamping. That's all well and good, but if you're using them backwards like I'm using them here, what that will do is tend to make that rotate off. So you need to make sure this one is a little bit lower than that. Other than that, it works. So I, I'm just going to come along and uh, clean out this one and then using that clamp, come over here somewhere probably and clean up this one. Uh, and then using this clamp, come over here and clean up this one. You can tell by the way by the, the beat up ends of my strap clamps that uh, I occasionally do run into them uh, and that's why that's a good idea that these things are like vice jaws are, are made out of a softer steel because if these were fully hardened not only would they be brittle but um, you'd, you'd really damage your cutter so just, just remember that. I've machined off the back of that. Um, they say that you can feel a one thou difference with your finger and I've got just a little bit of a lip there uh, and maybe a little bit over there. This seems to be all right. So at a future date, I think I'll get some emery onto a flat surface glass plate or something like that and, and give that a bit of a scrub just to, to flatten that off. Um, there is a little bit of porosity in the casting, but nothing to, to worry about there. What I've also done here is drilled some holes. And um, this is designed to fit on my T-slot in two ways. Now if you had different spacing T-slots you just move the holes in, possibly trim some of the flange off there if you wanted to. But if I put a line between there and there to there that's the T-slot spacing. If I put a line from there and to there to there and there to there that's the T-slot spacing. So it's on a square pattern. This is the important thing about that square pattern. Because I've, I've got that like that it means I can have this sitting on my table like that or I can have it sitting on my table like that or you know any which way I want. Uh, so it gives me just a little bit more versatility in, in how and where I can mount this. I've just run down with a uh, 15 and a half drill I think it is uh, and then I'm going to run a ream down there to take that out to 5 8 The boss is big enough that I could make that 3 quarter inch if I wanted to but uh, 5 8 seems uh, big enough uh, for what I want to do for the moment. So uh, that's all fine. One thing I will have to do is put a spot face on the uh, place where the nuts, the flange nuts sit just to uh, give that a little bit firmer contact. But uh, once that's done there I can put drill and tap a couple of grub screws in there, put a bit of rod in there and I'll have something that will then bolt to the, the table here and that'll be rock solid with a, with a rod which hopefully because of the way it's been made is vertical. This is uh, a pseudo casting. If this was a casting, uh, there'd be a little bit of draft in there and this would be a round shape. Uh, but as it was, I, I didn't particularly want to make up a pattern just to, to, for something this simple. So I've just milled it out of a bit of solid uh, and taken some corners off. So I've got an oct octagonal shape there. These two parts are going to act as a parallelogram, which means the links between them have to be um, exactly the same length and the distance between these holes have to be exactly the same length. So what I've done is I've drilled these out to four and a half. I've drilled that out to four and a half and put a reamer through it. I'm now going to put a dowel pin uh, in there and it looks like it's going to be a, a knock-in fit which is good and then I'll line that hole up with a with a gauge pin clamp it up and then I'll run the reamer through there and so that way I will hopefully get two five millimeter holes that are basically spot on. Here are my two parts uh, pinned together and uh, so that was a um, quite a neat fit there for the dowel pin so they're, they're firm but that lets me come along put that in a vise and then drill and bore those two holes and know that they should be um, parallel within at least you know quite a reasonable margin. I left that thickness there a little bit over half thickness so that when I do clamp that in the vise it's these two faces here that are going to be uh, taking the pressure and these ones won't. 
So that's another thing to, uh, to, to, to think about. Uh, as I said, I'm not quite sure whether I can use a vise on this or not. I might have to hang this out the end and drill and then shuffle it over, but I prefer to do it in one setup. So I might actually strap that to an angle plate or something like that. However, that's, that's how I'm going to get those two holes uh, parallel with respect to the pivot points here. Another way of doing that might be to set this up on, on the main pivot put the links in there and then lower that down so it's sitting in the vise and drill and tap or drill and, and, and bore, sorry, drill and, drill and bore that hole that way. So I'm going to put that in the vise. Now this style of vise has got a, a large nut that sits here and I don't particularly want to be drilling through into that. So what I'm going to do is put a bit of material in there and that will mean that the space underneath there is clear. I'll then uh, put the, the part in there and drill away. Now I have cheated here a little bit in that I've already drilled a hole through here and put a couple of brass bushes out either end of the hole. That's, that's okay because I'm, I'm not going to be uh, centering on these bushes, I'm going to be centering on the part um, to drill through but that way I've got I'll have brass on steel on this end and I'll have some, some Teflon bushes in this end so I won't have aluminium wearing away at a great rate of knots. I've now, having, having drilled my holes and uh, they're parallel, you can measure top and bottom and check that, uh, I've now separated the pieces, taken that down to 11 millimeters, and then tapped the holes M6. I'm now making up the two links that go between. Um, these are just a, a round plug, pop in there, and uh, I'm going to weld around there uh, and then square those off. You could actually use square tube for that and instead of having stuff from round stock here just mill it up. I guess the advantage of square tube is you can you can put a bolt through there, you can block tighten all that sort of thing, whereas here I, I, I need to weld otherwise I could have rotational issues. Uh, having said that, I don't think it matters too much one way or the other. So yes, weld and then square up. Next setup. I've made some linkages here. Uh, I rounded the ends using a, a rounding jig that I made up and that's the subject of another video. But I've now got them clamped together in the vise. I've got on the on the flat sides I've put a bit of flat there and that'll hold them together there. I've got a bit of uh, business card, old, old business card here just to allow for any um, irregularities in the shape. What I'm now going to do is find my center point, drill and then ream an 8mm hole down there, put in an 8mm pin and then come down and do the same here and that way I make sure I got the same length on each length rather than drilling them individually. Uh, I could put a bolt in there I guess but I've got a bit of 8mm uh, rod so uh, an 8mm dowel pin so that'll that'll do for that one. I've uh, drilled and then reamed out uh, a 10 millimeter hole here and then done the same down here so these two lengths now are spot on uh, they don't have to they don't have to to be an exact dimension but they are um, the same length on each link i did eventually put a, a piece of flat on here i thought better safe than sorry and so uh, these two are both uh, clamped up now these pieces those holes are the same distance apart. So using that I should have a parallelogram which means that when that is on a, on a, um, a 3 8 uh, rod this should move up and down and that hole should be or remain parallel to the hole here at all times. With this device I'm using a couple of um, things that I've, I've used for many many times over the years. These are shoulder bolts. I've talked about shoulder bolts before, but basically they're a ground finish there with a thread on the end. And these things are a Teflon bush. Now I buy mine from Gardner Bearings uh, in Cavan, and they are, they are an SKF product, but I believe that Inna do them, and there's probably a few others around the place, and you can probably buy them on eBay from China as well. But the way they work is that they're Teflon lined, and so on that ground surface and with the flange there against the head 
it gives you a very nice bearing surface. You can get them without the flange, by the way, if you just after a straight pivot. What I've done is on my linkage, I've put bushes either side and then a shoulder bolt through. And as I was saying before, that's, that's the same length, that's the same length and so on. So I've got a parallel linkage. My bracket here bolts down to the mill table and uh, the rod here, I'm not quite sure where to cut that off just yet because I was planning on having a, a stop there so that this wouldn't go down all the way but at the moment it's stiff. These things will, will take some time to bed in. Um, one of the first things that happens is that the Teflon that gets smeared here gets smeared onto, or the, that's embedded in this bushing gets smeared onto the bolt. I've now got a bracket I can clamp to my mill table. I've got a, a bracket here with a hole in it that will swing around this, this central pivot, but also can go up and down, and that hole is still going to be parallel to this rod. Because that's square to this, that means that that hole is always going to be square to the mill table. And so I'm now going to make up another bracket to come off here using that and these that'll hold a tap so I can use this as a tapping arm. Anyway, that's about all I've got time for uh, today. I'm running out of daylight. Last time you saw this, it had round bars on it like that, and they were just a, a plug welded around there and, and, and smoothed off. But two things happened. One is a friend of mine came in and said, well, can't you do anything better than that? But the other thing was that the bit that goes on here, which I haven't got on here at the moment, ended up having an eye type, eye beam type section. And I thought, well, if that's got an eye beam section, having these round is a bit silly. And uh, I'd just done the rounding over thing. So I thought, oh, okay, let's, let's make them like that. So I've replaced these with these. Uh, these are machined from solid, same bushes, all that sort of thing. Um, same technique as in, you know, drill one hole and ream it, put a pin in, drill the other one with a pin, and off we go. I guess the biggest difference is this thing here. When I put these on, um, this loosened up a bit and it flopped down. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna need to have, a, have some form of stop there. So I put just a, a, a it's actually got a crank in it because of uh, alignment issues. But I put this on here and then thought, well, I really need to, if I, if I want that to stop at a certain place, I made up these collars. Now these are just a round collar. They're, they're very similar to the Taylor Taylor Hobson collars. Um, the slot is slightly offset. Uh, when I cut that slot, they sprung in a bit, was able to take them back out to the, the, the 3 8 size. And they just sit in there like so and tighten up so that now this won't go further down than that. And that might be useful if you've got a high thing and you don't want the thing just crashing down. So that'll go up like that, but come down to there. And if you don't want that, well, okay, just screw that down. I've also put another collar down here so that if you wanted to do something similar and say, oh, I actually don't want this going down any further then, um, you can tighten that one up and that'll hold that down. Uh, so yes, just a couple of little enhancements there. So uh, there it is. Thanks for watching and uh, see you for the next part, which will be this arm here.